I, I think that what we did in the 60s and 70s was largely to, to make war on all the little communities in America, to make war on local government, to make war on state government, to make war on the churches, to make war on the family. And, 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 the, name of, and, and the name of this game is personal liberation. So, for example, we had, we had easy, no-fault divorce. That was the big revolution from the 60s and 70s. And, of course, it turns out that women, uh, uh, are, this has been disastrous for women because, you know, the man goes on with his high-status income and uh, women and their, and their dependent children are left with nothing. And I think that's a metaphor for a lot of what has, in fact, gone on. And uh, we have created a greater dependency of families and, and communities and individuals upon the national government. And I think all of that is, has been very bad. I think it's not just that the, the, the 1980s are not just more liberal and accepting of things like drugs and social pathology. It's also that all of the places where wholeness is created, where health and vitality are created, place, things like the family, things like local county government, uh, these have, these, have, these have been eroded and torn apart and in some cases destroyed, including black community participation. I mean, one of the things the Civil Rights Movement did, one of the, uh, unintentionally, was to destroy the old black communal leadership in the United States. And we see the price of that in the inner city, in, Ch in Chicago and Detroit. You know, there was no real conservative opposition in the, in the 1960s. The, the conservatives I knew then were obsessed with economics uh, and, 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 and getting out the vote. And they didn't understand that the impulses behind uh, the 60s revolution were as much reactionary impulses as they were uh, leftist impulses. The desire to restore community, concern for the environment, a, a, uh, a, a return to the isolationism, for example, of, uh, of the pre-World War II period. These were all hallmarks of, of American conservatism. And even the, something like folk music, which was so big in the 60s, what could be more, uh, more reactionary, more conservative than a desire to resurrect the music of Appalachia, the music of our forefathers? People started wearing what they thought were old-fashioned clothes. Uh, they, they wanted to recapture the sense of frontier life and rural life. Now, these are all very conservative impulses, but then you meet a typical conservative, and, and all he wants is a house in the suburbs or two cars. And they were the enemy. So that they, by not being conservative, by being nothing but cold, free market cold warriors, they missed the great chance. And it's not going to come again. The, the, the labels liberal and conservative used to mean something fairly clear. A liberal used to mean somebody who believed in the individual, who believed in the, the free market, who believed uh, that you should break down all the barriers toward individual self-expression. If this meant destroying the church or weakening the power of parents within their family, destroying social classes, all sorts of conventions, this is what liberals were in favor of. What conservatives were interested in doing were preserving a, a kind of cultural order, preserving a tradition, uh, preserving a sense of sacredness. Even if they weren't particularly religious themselves, they had to preserve that sense of the sacred. And what happened in the 1940s and 50s is that conservatism got defined as, well, as what used to be called liberal. In other words, the, the free market is everything, the individual is everything, forget family, forget, forget everything, essentially, but, uh, but, but the marketplace and the defense of the nation, you know, because the, liberal, the old liberals were also great colonialists. Uh, and the, the people who called themselves liberals were, in fact, socialists, or worse, you know. And uh, what was somebody with something like a conservative worldview going to do? There was no place. There was no label. There was no party. There was no movement. And it's like inv uh, conservative environmentalists today. The, the, most, the, 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 the greatest environmental thinker, the most powerful philosopher of conservation today is Wendell Berry, who is a conservative. He lives off in his little farm in, in rural Kentucky, he writes these books about how uh, managing his own little family farm. He's a, he's a Christian. He's a traditionalist. But he's on the board of the Sierra Club. Why? Because there's no conservative organization that would welcome Wendell Berry. They think he's the devil incarnate. 
And that's the, that, that, in a nutshell, is the failure of American conservatism, not to make a place for the real social and cultural and moral conservatives who have surfaced from time to time. Jack Kerouac was a conservative, and nobody knew that at the time. Why was he a conservative? He thought of himself as a, as a man of the right. He thought he was a, he was a, he was a patriot. He was a rugged, old-fashioned individualist, but he lo he loved America. He hated all the, the this rise of America bashing of the '60s, and uh, he's he's quite a, an interesting person. Obviously, he was a moral anarchist in some sense, but but way down deep, I mean, he he had this kind of impulses of a Baudelaire, who was also a conservative.